have to be a little bit more uh, schematic in my presentation, depending on exactly how many questions I get, which I, I, I want to encourage. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, depending on how, how uh, quickly or slowly we go. So I, I think uh, I've, I've posted some notes already on, on the Slack channel and a, and a little bibliography of some papers where you can find more details. Um, and please just get in touch. Uh, uh, and, and, and I don't know exactly what the format you guys uh, have decided on, but I'm, I'm happy to take questions uh, um, during, during the, the, the seminar if something is not clear. Um, I, I'd rather I'd rather you, uh, there was a, people understood things than necessarily get to some particular fixed endpoint. Um, so let me let me just start broadly. Uh, I guess the, the the subject I'm going to talk about is is um, uh, could be called an integrable holography. Um, and and the idea is that we're going to study examples of holography where we really can model everything quite precisely and, and, and we have really good control over the full quantum theory. So this um, is just one setting and there's sort of toy models where you can really calculate things very precisely, um, but they're not trivial examples, right? You could imagine coming up with some very trivial example of holography where everything was, let's say, free or, or some, some really simple setting. Here you have non-BPS quantities, you have quantum corrections, but yet you can calculate. And so this is obviously a, a vast area um, that has been developing over the years. And I, I, I've drawn this uh, attempt at a diagram. So we understand examples of ADS-CFD in this integrable way um, quite well for ADS-5-CSD4 and ADS-4-CFD3. And then in decreasing order as you go down in dimensions, because necessarily there is less supersymmetry, even for the maximally supersymmetric backgrounds. Uh, but we know that such examples exist also for ADS-3 CFT2 and ADS-2 CFT1. And I've been spending uh, a lot of time on the ADS-3 case uh, over the past few years. But just to give you a feeling for the sort of thing that integrability can give you, wh what, do, what do I mean by you know, being able to calculate things really precisely? Well, I expect you all know in N equals four uh, super young mills, there is a... Um, operator known as the Kanishi operator um, and uh, which just is you know you take you take your favorite uh, scalars your six scalars you uh, take a square of it to make a singlet and you trace it to make it a gauge invariant and that's a Kanishi operator and it's a fairly generic short uh, non-BPS operator right it has anomalous dimensions and it, these days, I, I spent the weekend checking with the with the guys who do these calculations, and the, uh, uh, and they tell me that you you know using integrability analytically, they can calculate to eleven loops the anomalous dimension of this operator. And if you don't care about analytic answers and just want a numerical value, right? Like uh, in the end, this is just a number, right? Um, they can do it to something between twenty and eighty digit precision to I don't know a thousand loops. Um, and they can also do it at strong coupling uh, analytically to three loops uh, and see that as, as you extrapolate from weak to strong coupling, the answers match up. So this is the kind of crazy, almost science fiction type uh, precision that, that, you know, I think when Maldasena first uh, uh, introduced holography, I don't think he, he would have expected <laughs> that we'd be able to test it quite so rigorously. Um, and I think for me, at least, this is a message that, you know, ADS-CFD is correct. And, and so this is uh, one kind of way to, to, to see that and, and, and therefore gives you confidence that if you study less uh, symmetrical situations, uh, not integrable situations, but other situations, you expect the general principles that underline holography uh, to hold. You sort of have more confidence in it. So I don't know, I, I hesitated to write here that this is like the Bohr atom of holography. <laughs> Um, because I guess uh, the Bohr atom actually exists uh, <laughs> in the real world. Um, so, I, but you know, it's the theoretical Bohr atom. Okay, so what are the kind of key players that we have in this game? Well, integrable two-dimensional models, and we're gonna, I'm going to try to say a little bit about them, um, they're an enormous field in physics and mathematics. And so 
uh, I've been stressing quite a lot about how I can, I know that the audience here is probably not uh, necessarily expert in integrability, so I'm not really sure uh, how much detail I'll be able to provide for you, but you know, before uh, holography, people studied integrability in, since, since the days of better in the 1930s and then Young and Baxter in the 60s and, and this incredible work of the Leningrad School and the Fadeev uh, really put the formal kind of mathematical physics structure uh, together. So what I'm going to loosely refer to as these kinds of models that let's say were kind of developed in the 60s, 70s, 80s, maybe up to the 90s, um, I'm going to call these kinds of conventional integrable models and to distinguish them from the holographic integral models. And examples of this, I guess, depending on exactly what your background is, you probably would have encountered something like the XXX one half spin chain or the Sigma model on the three sphere, the principal chiral model on SU2 or the gross Navier model, which is, you know, fermions in one plus one dimensions with quartic interactions. So all three of these models are actually they, they all governed by the same Yangian symmetry. Um, there's some extra hidden symmetries that I'll try to say a bit about later this afternoon. And the structure is very rigid. Uh, and, and so you can understand them quite uh, precisely. Now, on the other hand, when integrable holography came along, people initially would have thought, well, you know, we've studied so many examples and there are classification theorems by Drinfeld and others, you know, telling you how to classify integrable systems. And so, the, you know, if you, maybe the idea was if you opened the right integrability book on the right page, you would find uh, this particular string theory integrable model, maybe in some weird variables or something. But actually, the real message that, that came out of all this work is that the string theory models do not fit into any such classification or family. They really are different. And I think physically, this, this can be understood in the following way. Um, holography really, at least in the planar limit, is about varying Toft's uh, coupling constant. You know, if you at weak coupling, you have small lambda, you're essentially a gauge theory. If you had strong coupling, you're essentially some semi-classical sigma model. And this is this this kind of parameter doesn't really have a good analog in conventional integrability. So I want to stress here that the this expansion in lambda um, is quite different from the derivative of momentum expansion. So you know you can you can imagine doing some one plus one dimensional field theory and and doing a momentum expansion in in, in how how you know how much energy the excitations have. And so those kinds of expansions are well known, but they are very different from the lambda expansion. So how does integrable holography really work? Well, what happens is at weak coupling, you have this famous Mina Hanzarembo spin chain, um, where you consider an operator, um, oops, keep switching to, sorry. Um, you consider, a, for example, a single trace operator, a gauge invariant operator. And again, I have in n equals four, I have some scalars x, y, and z. And at each site in my auxiliary spin chain, I put a x, y, or a z, for example. And it turns out that if you give this spin chain a Hamiltonian, um, just like that of the xxx spin chain, just a nearest neighbor Hamiltonian, and you calculate the dimensions of those operators, that's going to calculate for you uh, the anomalous dimensions of the corresponding operator initially at one loop. And then if you include higher and higher order corrections at higher and higher order loops. So le less and less local interactions. In this case. Now, if you crank up lambda, um, you end up with uh, instead a integrable uh, one plus one dimensional field theory living on the spin chain, uh, living on the world sheet rather, in which instead of having these kinds of excitations like this, so think of X as an excitation above the vacuum Z, think of Y as another excitation above the vacuum um, Z. And so you, you add a whole bunch of such excitations in this uh, picture. And to make everything consistent, you need to understand how those excitations, how those magnons go past each other in an S matrix type theory. So 
the lambda coupling really interpolates between these two pictures. And there's a kind of quantum spectral curve that has been developed where you can really do this as an intermediate coupling where it's neither a spin chain nor an integrable sigma model. It is just what it is. It's this integrable structure. But at these two limits, you get these more classical pictures emerge. So one question you might want to ask is, is this kind of framework, um, is there a unified framework where conventional holography and integrable holography sit together? Or is integrable holography just some weird thing on its own? Now, another question you might want to ask is if you study on um, this integrable way of looking at uh, one plus one dimensional um, systems, you very often have some S matrix type picture where you have some excitations, there's an S matrix, they scatter, and you know, in, in, in integrable theories, you, you, you only have really um, two to two scattering and then everything else gets built up from that using the Young-Baxter equation. And I guess if this is the first time you see this kind of language, when you look at, at, at these books, it, it looks very different from the sort of language that people who, who do quantum field theory and Feynman diagrams use, right? In Feynman diagrams, there are some virtual particles, there are loops, you have to integrate over stuff. And here, you just have this S matrix. So it's quite different language. And so there's a question about whether you can find some quantum field theory formulation where things like the R matrix, same as the S matrix, let's say, the Young-Baxter equation emerge from diagrams and so it's from normal sort of Feynman diagrams, but in such a way that the integrable symmetries are treated as conventional symmetries. And so you see, of course, if I have, you know, if we take a, a, a sigma model on a free sphere, um, of course, I can just do scattering on the world sheet, right? I can decompactify my world sheet. I can have some plane waves at plus and minus infinity and they can scatter, sure. We can do that, but we can do that for a non-integrable sigma model as well. So what I'm asking here is, is it possible to find a quantum field theory in which the integrable charges themselves, all these extra hidden charges, look like just ordinary charges, the ones that we used to in uh, ordinary quantum field theories. And finally, a kind of vague, more inspirational kind of question. I guess the other thing that's odd about looking in, at integrable systems is, you know, there's all this kind of, you'll see shortly, there's all this stuff like lax, flat lax connection and some spectral parameter living on some algebraic curve and so on. And there's this feeling that even though everything you're doing is algebraic and, and representation theoretic, right? Everything is just some Youngian and some representation of some Youngian, secretly there should be some geometric origin to all. And, and maybe if we can understand this geometric origin, maybe we can learn some new things about maybe holography and string. So what I want to do is I want to give you a, 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 a little invitation to, to why four-dimensional Chern-Simons theory um, is starting to answer some of these questions. A little bit of question one, a little bit of question two, and maybe hopefully, you know, <laughs> as someone in this audience and, and, and others over the coming years, we'll, we'll, we'll get a better feeling for how to answer question three. Okay, so my plan is as follows. As I said, it's kind of ambitious, so I'm gonna uh, see how we go. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the Green-Schwartz superstring and how kappa symmetry enters that. And this is a really important ingredient to understand in terms of integrable holography because all this integrability story is most clear uh, in the Green-Schwartz formulation of the superstring. That doesn't mean that there isn't one in, in other formulations. People know about integrability and in pure spinner and so on, but it isn't as developed. Um, and then I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and introduce, uh, give a very brief introduction into integrable sigma models. So just tell you a little bit about um, what they are, what makes them integrable and so on. And that will be the plan for today. And then depending on how we do uh, with that, we will get to tomorrow four-dimensional Chern-Simons theory and its sort of string theory analog, which is the Beltrami Chern-Simons. Okay, so let me just pause here and see if there are questions. While we change.
Don't see any questions in the chat or raise hands. So please unmute hey. yourself if you have a question. Yeah, uh, I definitely would appreciate. I mean, this is one of the things I'm missing quite a lot is not not being able to, you know, see people's faces. And that's the first time I'm giving these lectures. So if something is not clear or you'd like me to clarify or something or have a comment, please let me know. Okay, good. So let's. Kappa symmetry can be this very sort of uh, technical subject. But actually, at its heart, it's very simple. So I, I'm going to talk in a little bit of detail about the superparticle. So we're going to think about some world line, which is going to be parametrized by time tau. And we're going to embed our superparticle uh, in, into some target space. And here are the bosonic coordinates of that target space. And it'll be d-dimensional. And we will have some super partners. So this is, if you want, this is this is the beginnings of how you would do it in, in, in a world sheet string theory, but we're just going to treat the world sheet uh, uh, space coordinate sigma as a constant. We're just going to focus on a super partner. Some of the essential lessons are already available here. So first thing you can do, right, is, so let's start slowly, is you can, you can uh, figure out how supersymmetry acts here. And supersymmetry acts very simply. It just takes a fermion and it maps it to, uh, as the variation of the fermion is just some constant spinner. Notice I haven't really told you how many such spinners I have. And actually this story will work for any number of spinners and any amount of supersymmetry, classically. So then how does the bosonic coordinate x uh, vary? Well, it varies like this. Um, it just, the boson will go to a fermion and then in order to make it, you know, to give it the right uh, Lorentz indices, uh, you combine it with epsilon and a gamma mu. Okay, just a brief reminder that I'm gonna be working with Majorana spinners and this is the bar, it means complex con uh, Hermitian conjugation and. Uh, and uh, charge, conjugate, uh, charge conjugation. And finally, my other ingredient for supersymmetry is going to be that um, the, the uh, world line, the pullback of the field bind to the world line um, is not going to vary under supersymmetry. So what kind of actions can I write down? Well, one, one action you could write down is something that just depends on theta dot because theta transforms as, you know, as a constant. So theta dot, the variation of theta dot will just be zero. Well, that's not very exciting. It doesn't have a bosonic analog. So instead, let's define this uh, P mu, which I've got underlined here in blue, which is going to be like X dot and this bilinear in firm. So you can check, uh, I guess I'm not gonna go through in too much detail, but look, here is the, um, here, here is uh, the variation of the boson. Here is the variation of the fermion. This theta dot guy doesn't contribute uh, because of this equation. And when you combine the two terms together, uh, remembering that epsilon is a constant, you get zero. So the lesson is, you give me any function of theta dot and this momentum p mu, and it'll be super symmetric. Okay, it's kind of a trivial free theory, so nothing much is going on. But we want to start with something that's bosonically what we used to, and then supersymmetrize it, right? So we can start with a term which is like x dot squared and supersymmetrize it in this way by including this p mu. And what I want you to look at in a bit of detail is what do the equations of motion look like? So there are going to be three equations of motion, one for the world sheet metrics or world line metric. That's just a variation with respect to E, which tells you that P squared is equal to zero. And this is like the Virasoro condition. Uh, I'm putting it in inverted commas, right? It's, it's whatever the analog of the Virasoro condition is for a superpower. Now you could instead vary X and you will get a perfectly conventional equation which starts off as x double dot, um, whoops, uh, you probably can't see that, x double dot plus some fermions. 
The interesting thing is what happens when you vary the action with respect to theta. So here is the theta term, and if you vary it, you end up with a very weird equation. This equation does not start as theta dot equal plus some corrections equals zero. Instead, the leading term is x dot, uh, gamma, x dot mu gamma mu theta dot equal to zero. So that's, I've written it schematically over here. What you have is some non-trivial matrix M, which is just P slash times theta dot equals zero. Now this matrix M is half maximal rank. So how do we see that? Well, let's calculate M squared. So it's P times gamma, P times gamma. Symmet you know, you symmetrize, so you get identity matrix on the spinner indices just in the way that you would normally do. And you have a P squared here, but P squared, remember, that was our Virasoro condition. So this is equal to zero. So we have the equation of motion for the fermion is super weird. It is a matrix of half maximal rank, right? It's got these uh, Jordan blocks uh, with the generalized eigenvalue equal to zero. They all two by two blocks, they all zeros except in the top corner and one. So it's a half, ma half rank um, matrix and then theta dot equals zero. So this matrix M effectively what it does is it eliminates half of the fermions half of the fermions don't have an equation of motion. They completely decouple from the theory. And this is at the heart of kappa symmetry. This is something that Siegel explained. Um, and he basically found that there is a local symmetry, um, which you wouldn't know was there, but it's this local symmetry, uh, which allows you then to eliminate half of the fermions. So the symmetry I, I, I write it out here, it takes a fermion and maps it to P slash times some symmetry transformation guy. And it takes a boson um, and maps it again to P slash times some general parameter kappa. Kappa is an arbitrary function, right? It's a local transformation. So I guess I'm not gonna have time, but I've written down in the notes it's very easy to check that this action, that the action that we had over here, uh, where are we? This one over here has got kappa symmetry. So you just plug in, I've, I've written it out here, so go over it, ask me questions in Slack. But this action has got kappa symmetry as long as I also require that the field bind transform non trivially too. So this is the lesson I want you to take from this transparency here, is if I give you some super string action, kappa symmetry works in the following way. You vary the matter fields, you have some fermionic variation, whatever it is, right? You have to look at the details of the theory. Here is some set of details. The action will not be invariant under just those transformations, but you can compensate and make the action invariant under kappa symmetry by requiring the world sheet metric, or in this case, just the world line metric, to transform non-trivially as well. Okay. Any questions on this point? So let me now switch to um, the green short superstring in flat space. And I'm gonna be super quick here because this is all explained in some detail in, in, in uh, uh, chapter five of Green Schwartz Witten. Um, but I want to again, just highlight how the super string shares some similarities and how it has some differences. So the first term in the super string action, you will recognize is essentially the same as what I had. So you have like an X dot term and a theta gamma theta dot term except now you don't just have time derivatives, right? You have time and space world sheet derivatives. 
Unfortunately, that is not invariant on the kappa transformations on its own. And you have to add this so-called Vesumino term. We call it a Vesumino term because it involves uh, the world sheet epsilon uh, two form rather than the world sheet metric uh, gamma. So in the superstring, you cannot just have this free, this kinetic term, you have to add a Vesumino term. And the action is only invariant under um, kappa symmetry if you have n equals one or n equals two supersymmetry. And it's only invariant as long as certain Fiert's identities are true. So basically, there are some ancient uh, Fiert's identities for the products of gamma matrices that Gliotzi, uh, Scherk, uh, and Olive, and, and, and Brink, and, and others, and Brink and Schwartz, um, used in the 70s to show that, for example, n equals 1, the n equals 1, d equals 10, super young Mills theory uh, is supersymmetric. So there's these famous Fiertz identities, and it's the same ones that make the green Schwartz superstring um, kappa symmetric, as long as you're in 3, 4, 6, and 10 dimensions um, with the corresponding minimal spinners, and as long as you only have n equals 1 or 2 supersymmetry. Now, when you're going through this, if this is interesting to you, and if you're going through it in a little bit more detail, you one thing, one technical point I want to emphasize, to stress that, that, that you see, because it's going to come up later on, is that the kappa transformations themselves, here they are, some horrible looking mess, but here they are, they, you have to decompose uh, the world sheet. So the kappa transformations depend on, have a, have a um, vector index on the world sheet. And when you're actually going through it, the world sheet metric has transforms differently for the self-dual vector and the anti-self-dual vector. There are these two different contributions for the two different kappa parameters. So it, it's a really strange symmetry for the superstring. It's even stranger than in the case of the superparticle. Basically, you somehow are combining target space supersymmetry with you know, irreducible representations on the world sheet. After all, in two, di in two dimensions, the vector representation is reducible, and we can split it into a self-dual and an anti-self-dual part, and, and you're supposed to treat them a little bit separate. So that's kind of the important thing that I wanted to say here. Um, and it's fun as an exercise to take this horrible, complicated action, right, and to fix kappa gauge in the following way. So this is two gamma matrices. And you just require that you, this projector um, uh, acting on theta is zero. And that's uh, how you fix the fermionic kappa symmetry. And then the bosonic symmetry you fix by a sort of light cone gauge. And in that gauge, you just have eight uh, free bosons and eight plus eight free fermions. So everything really simplifies. But you had to pick the right gauge. If you didn't pick the right gauge, everything looks like a terrible mess. Okay. More questions? Sorry, maybe I should show that again. I don't know, I've lost it. Yeah. Yeah, this S is essentially some of the, is half of the fetus. Okay, thanks. So it's the half of the fetus that are not uh, equal to zero. Uh, sorry, that are, that satisfy this condition. So um, a slightly more covariant way of writing this is requiring something like this. I might have some minus signs wrong. So this is, this is a projector and you either keep a plus or a minus and the one that you keep you call S. Okay, more questions? Okay, so you see, kappa symmetry looks pretty horrible, right? Already in flat space. But luckily, so, so you might think this will be a complete disaster in, uh, in, uh, if, if we go to more complicated backgrounds. And indeed, formally, there is there are formal expressions 
for you give me some supergravity solution, I have to then work out what all the supergravity superfields super look like. And, and this is terrible because you have to work out some torsion constraints, but in principle, you can do it. And then there is a Green Schwartz action. Now, if this was the action that we would have to work with, I, I think you know, people would have given up long time ago. And this was the really amazing thing that uh, Metsayev and Seidlin did, based on some earlier work of Heno and Mazinchescu. Um, so Metsayev and Seidlin showed us that there is a much nicer way of thinking about ADS5 crosses 5 superstring, green short superstring, in terms of a sort of symmetric space coset. And then everything becomes algebraic and much simpler, and the equations really look much nicer. They really start looking a, a little bit like we're doing sigma models on, on symmetric spaces. So let's see a little bit of that. So here is ADS5 crosses 5, just the bosonic part. Um, here is the 5 sphere, and here is the ADS analog of it. And the nice thing about this particular coset is that it's not just G mod H, but it's a symmetric space. So what is a symmetric space in case uh, you don't remember from, from ge geometry lessons? Um, well, a symmetric space is a type of coset where the stuff at the bottom, its commutator gives you back the stuff at the bottom in the, in the denominator. If you take something from the numerator and you commute it with, um, uh, and you commute it with something in the denominator, you get back G mod H and if you take the commutator of g mod h with g mod h, you go back down to the denominator. So um, there's a, and, and these are sort of the nicest possible uh, cosets that you can have. And the reason for that is somehow there's this very simple algebraic reason, which is that there is a Z2 automorphism that acts on uh, this space. Everything that's in h has eigenvalue plus one. Everything that's in G minus H has eigenvalue uh, minus one. And you can see that this automorphism is uh, consistent with these three commutation relations. So you might do a nice exercise. Uh, you could, if, if you want to, you could check, for example, that in the case of uh, the five sphere, um, the algebra. So, so we've got these matrices M, I, J, uh, where I and J uh, run from one to six, right? They're anti-symmetric. We all know their commutation relations. And you could check that the SO5 guys form a subalgebra and that the SO6 mod SO5 guys um, will have precisely these commutation relations here. Okay, so that's a simple check. Um, so there is this automorphism on SO6 mod SO5. And another thing that you might find fun to do is to convince yourself that four by four gamma matrices, so there's five of them, they generate for you SO5 symmetry. But if you wanted to include also the gamma i's, so just write down your favorite basis, that appear when you're writing down the Metsayev uh, Zaitlin uh, superstring. And if you haven't done these kinds of calculations before, you might like to figure out how to, to exponentiate some matrices. Um, in particular, it's, it, it's nice to see if you want to have an element of SO6 um, over SO5, well, here is one such element. You take uh, your gamma matrices, which, sit, which belong to SO6 minus SO5. Um, so those are the gamma i's. The gamma i j's, they sit inside SO5 itself, so we don't need them. And you can exponentiate this guy, and because you know how gamma matrices square, uh, you can very easily compute what g is. It'll be cos of something and sine of something else, and it's a fun exercise to do. Um, and you can also compute uh, for example, the, the currents. So how do we compute the currents? Well, here's how you would do it. Here is the starting. So you, you could do it order by order if you wanted to for any matrix, uh, for, any, for any G. 
So here is G inverse, right? It's got these minus signs and plus signs alternating. And here is DG, which looks like that. And order by order, you can calculate. Uh, the, and that is, uh, and, and this is the expression. And all I want you to really take from this is that this guy belongs to the Lie algebra. Right, G belongs to the Lie group, um, and J belongs to the Lie algebra. Why does it belong to the Lie algebra? Well, it just involves all the commutators, right? So commutators and more and more commutators, so, so everything sits in the Lie algebra. Okay, now on a symmetric space, the nice thing is that there's a decomposition, right? We can use this automorphism of the Lie algebra to split up things that belong to H, and that belong to G minus H. That's just any element can be written in this form. And well, I won't have time to, to go over this, but geometrically, this is the spin connection. J0 is the spin connection, and J2 is the field by. So it's quite nice well, on symmetric spaces. It's a really nice, you could, you could, you could have a whole course on uh, how geometry is described on symmetric spaces just in this algebraic way. For us, What's nice is you can show that with contracting the world sheet metric, um, here, here's my world sheet metric, that this action is just the usual sigma model action on the symmetric space G mod H. So that really follows from the fact that the field bind is this J2. So here I just have you know, um, E dot E which is precisely the metric uh, G alpha beta. So it's a nice exercise again to check that this is true. Okay, so that's the sort of lightning overview of um, what uh, symmetric spaces and what sigma models on symmetric spaces would look like. Essentially everything that you're doing is you're writing down an action of this form using this nice Z2 automorphism. And well, a, if you want to add supersymmetry, then um, there's some work of Berkowitz uh, and uh, Zwiebach and uh, a few other collaborators, uh, I want to say Bersatsky and Hauer, um, who showed that actually you can write down actions which are sort of supersymmetric if you use instead a semi-symmetric space. So in a semi-symmetric space, like ADS, like the supersymmetric ADS5 cross S5 space, your currents don't decompose into just two components, but decompose into four, because there's a Z4 automorphism that you have. And on such backgrounds, uh, you can write down an action of this form. Okay, so this is the matsayev zeitlin action. And look, you recognize the nice kinetic term, that's just telling you, and, and, and these are just the field binds, the bosonic field binds. So that's going to give you the metric. But there is the second term, so the Zunino term. Um, we call it the Zunino term simply because it depends on the world sheet epsilon rather than the world sheet metric. And that's something that you see appeared also in, in the flat space action that I briefly, flat space green Schwartz action that I briefly showed you. So, Unfortunately, I, I, I wanted to go over this, but unfortunately, I, I don't think I will have time. But I've written down here a set of notes of how, if you start with the flat space supersymmetry algebra, that flat space supersymmetry algebra itself has got a Z4 automorphism. And if you write down this action for, for the specific example of the flat space supersymmetry algebra, you will just recover the So I guess this will just, uh, I, I, I'm happy to, I'll hang around on Slack and so on. So if, if you're going through the details of this calculation and something's unsure, just ask me questions. But the bottom line is that both the flat space action and the ADS5 action, and actually also the plane wave background action, can all be written down in this sort of fairly general form which just cares about the fact that you have a Z4 automorphism on some uh, super algebra. Okay, we pause here, see if people have questions. Right. 
Where can we find the lecture notes? I have posted them on Slack. Um, for the first lecture, I'm going to try to post for the second lecture and the other lectures as well, but all this stuff. Okay. And they, I'm told by Elena that they'll also be on Indica. Okay. So now I want to show you how much simpler kappa symmetry is um, in this coset formulation. Right? So you, here is the Metzayat Seidler in action. Just to make you comfortable with it, here are some Neffer currents, which again, as an exercise, you can calculate simply from the Neffer procedure. So this action is invariant under uh, left multiplication uh, by some global H. So remember, J is equal to G minus one DG, and uh, it, you can multiply from the left by a global H, um, an H that is independent of tau and sigma and see that that's a symmetry, you can work out what is the corresponding Neffer current. You can also calculate what is the Virasoro condition, which is just the equation of motion of the world sheet metric. So here it is, this is the world sheet metric guy. Okay? And so you can calculate um, what that looks like. And so it's essentially just a super trace over uh, J alpha, J alpha, just the two component the one which has eigenvalue minus one. So I'm always gonna be using this sort of notation. So this has eigenvalue minus one. Now, what's really nice and, and is emphasized and explained in great detail uh, in, in the beautiful notes uh, by Arutyunov and Frolov that I've uh, cited in, the, in my bibliography is that you can think of kappa symmetry as right multiplication. So, instead of multiplying from the left to get a global charge, you multiply from the right by some uh, group element e to the epsilon, and epsilon itself is local. So it will depend on tau and sigma. And so this is a symmetry that's not super obvious, but that you can go ahead and I want to spend a little bit of time showing you how that symmetry works. So the first thing to notice is that if this is the transformation of G, well, the currents are gonna have to transform covariantly like this, right? Because the currents take value in the Lie algebra. And so this is if you want just the derivative, the covariant derivative. Now, because of the Z4 symmetry, um, this current equation, uh, how, how the current transforms decomposes uh, into various uh, Z4 eigenspaces. So look, for example, here is the plus I eigenspace. And notice that it's the same guy that appears here. And here you, you take the product, right, of plus one times plus I, which is also plus I. into the metzayev zeitlin action, which I've written right at the top here. And you do some integration by parts um, and you arrive at this expression here. So the details again, uh, you can uh, either go through these notes or also really look through the, the Arutyunov uh, notes. But the basic idea is this is how the matter fields how the currents J vary under kappa symmetry. And I'm not telling you how the world sheet metric varies. So we have to work through uh, how that varies. And you'll see again, these projectors onto the self-dual and anti-self-dual components of the vector representation appearing. Okay, so this is, this is how the action varies. And now what we do is, so this is, so far, everything I have said is completely general, right? I haven't told you what my target space symmetry is. All I've said is that there's a Z4 automorphism. But of course, kappa symmetry doesn't exist for every Z4 uh, coset. We're going to pick a specific coset, namely PSU224, in which matrix multiplication is allowed, 
And there's an explicit form for what the um, Z4 automorphism looks like. And you're going to require that these local transformations, epsilon, where are they? Uh, right, these ones over here, that they can be written in terms of J2 times kappa, where kappa is a general, it is now the general variation. So this should be reminding you a little bit of when we were writing down the kappa transformations in flat space. Um, and the, those kappa transformations, they looked like um, P gamma slash kappa. So if you look at look back to, to that section, you will always see a factor of P gamma appearing. Um, and that's th this guy here is, is essentially that P gamma factor. And kappa is the general transformation that you can have. So, OK, you're told this is what the transformations look like. Um, and now you plug that in, and you can check that the action, the variation of the action, now simplifies quite dramatically. And it looks like this. So the details, again, you can go through them. Um, and I'm happy to if you ask me lots of questions about it on Slack. But here's what I want you to take from this equation. There is a uh, variation of the world sheet metric, which we don't know what it is yet. We haven't specified it. And when we arrive at this expression here, you'll notice that we have two super traces instead of one super trace in each of the terms. And that is because we've used the Fiertz identity secretly. So what's going on is we, we have an expression like this. And when you uh, write it out explicitly, it involves a product of J2 with J2, because your kappa transformations now introduce an extra factor of J2. And two J2s together, well, you see, they look like a product. If you write it out in terms of the matrices, they look like a product of those gamma matrices we talked about. And so, in fact, J2, J2 can be written as the identity matrix times some prefactor and this funny matrix, upsilon, um, which is of this form, so is some hypercharge of the PSU224 algebra um, with some other coefficient. And, and this coefficient here looks like that. OK, so this is a little bit technical. But when you plug this in, this guy cancels, doesn't appear, whereas the upsilon guy does appear. And you end up with two terms like this. So if this was. Uh, this was a little brief, but all I want you to take from this is here is the matter variation of the Metsayat Satan action uh, under kappa symmetry variations. That is not zero, but it has precisely the right form so that we can, we can cancel that variation by declaring that the world sheet metric transforms in this way. And in doing that, we have used Fiertz identities, um, which are special to PSU224, and they're the analogs of um, Fiertz identities in flat space. And the fact that we can cancel this is actually non-trivial, right? The right-hand side has got to be symmetric under alpha, beta, and it's also got to be real and bosonic, uh, and it has to satisfy this unimodularity property, because this is, after all, uh, not just the, the metric, but this is, after all, uh, the, the sort of normalized metric, right? Gamma is given by this expression. Sorry, I, I should write an H here. Okay. So uh, luckily, uh, this is this is precise. This variation is precisely of this type, and so kappa symmetry will work. Okay. But it's still, I think, relatively simple and relatively algebraic uh, compared to uh, how you might obtain um, an, uh, an action just from supergravity. Any questions here? So let me summarize. Um, what we learned is this, that kappa symmetry, which is really important for writing down an action which is space for superstrings, which is space time symmetric, is a local fermionic symmetry. It's a really strange symmetry, right? It's, it's like a gauge symmetry, but it's fermionic. 
And it allows us to remove half of the fermions um, in our theory. And I haven't touched on this, but that, that is what really uh, allows you to form on shell the right kind of multiplets between bosons and fermions. So you have the right number of degrees of freedom. Now, for the superstring, for this free superparticle, we could have however much supersymmetry we wanted, however much kappa symmetry we wanted. But for the superstring, this is only possible in certain dimensions where some magical Fierce identities happen in flat space. In ADS5 cross S5, and I didn't say this, but also in other backgrounds like ADS4 CP3 or the plane wave backgrounds and so on, there is a very nice um, algebraic or coset type uh, superstring action, which avoids all of the difficulty of writing down the superfields, uh, checking that they satisfy the supergravity torsion constraints, and so on. All of that is sort of automatically built into, into this algebraic formulation and is fully equivalent um, to, this, uh, to the supergravity formulation. Um, and it relies on the presence of the Z4 symmetry and the presence of some fierce identities for PSU224. And finally, what's nice about this is that kappa symmetry takes a relatively simple form here. It's just local, well, it's local because the kappa symmetry is a sort of local gauge symmetry, right multiplication. Whereas the global symmetries uh, are uh, left multiplication. Okay, so I think uh, this is probably a good place to stop. Uh, well, thank you very much. Let's thank Bogdan for the uh, beautiful lecture. And uh, please, uh, now we have time uh, for questions. So uh, again, either, uh, well, I, I don't see any, any raised hands. So either raise hands or uh, just simply unmute yourself and uh, and uh, ask the question. So, well, maybe maybe I'll start uh, while people are raising hands. So uh, maybe a naive question. So you described this couple symmetry in the, on the uh, uh, wall sheet uh, side. So in, in, at weak coupling, say in ads -AC, if I have some spin chain picture, is there an analog of this couple symmetry that you can see at weak coupling in, in the gauge theory? So the, I guess uh, um, the, the quick answer would be no. Okay. Um, and the reason would be uh, that uh, essentially the matching, the, this kind of picture that I drew between yeah. the spin chain and the sigma model, uh, it's only for physical degrees of freedom. So we, when we do this matching, we fully fix kappa symmetry and then try to match two. Now, of course, <laughs> You know, you can dream now. Uh, could you come up with some mysterious kappa symmetry, you know, some covariant version? It, I mean, you know, it should be possible to do everything covariantly and, and maybe keep this gauge invariance somehow. Do, but, you know, that's uh, uh, more dream than, than reality. Thanks. Um, more questions, please. Well, I uh, don't see any questions at the moment, so uh, maybe we, we will uh, see more uh, questions on Slack channel. Let me remind you that you can go there and uh, uh, post your question there. So uh, then I, I suggest uh, for now we, we, thank, we thank Bogdan again and, uh, and uh, we, we will have a break now for, I guess, 55 minutes. And we will uh, reconvene at uh, 5 p.m. Uh, Geneva time for the our evening session. So I, th I think we will keep this uh, Zoom running. So if you want to stick around, but otherwise we'll see each other in 55 minutes. Okay, thanks. Let me...